I wanted to be in that position where you're going into a race as the man to beat. In order to win races, you have to train hard. And the easiest way to do that is to close down. <laughs> Pressure putting on myself is mainly for myself. I know what I have to do over the next 10 months in order to be competitive. Well, Christian, thank you so much for making the time to join us for this face-to-face -face podcast. It's lovely to have you here and have the chance to chat to you and get to know you a little bit better. When I was thinking about um, your career and looking through like your list of achievements, it's, it's like a kind of like a every, basically everything you'd want to win, more or less, you've won. Do you sometimes feel like kind of, yeah, I've, I've conquered triathlon a little bit already? Uh, I, I try to not think about the races that I've won. Like, uh, of course, having the world title from short course and up to Ironman and also the Olympic gold is something I dreamed about as a kid. Uh, but then uh, I think like when I first won the Olympics once, you also want to do it again. And uh, so I try to not think too much about like the races I've done in the past, but more looking forward to the next uh, uh, challenge. I think that's also what has been a part of the reason for the success that I've been able to have uh, in the back end of Tokyo. Like, I guess it's quite natural to sort of be happy and sort of settle down after winning a race like that. Well, I felt straight on. I wanted to go straight on to like taking the short distance title and then going on to Armen, which was supposed to be in October then before it got postponed to May. And sort of, I always wanted to have like a new challenge straight after and. Uh, uh, it's sort of the same now, like even though I've won all of those races in the past, I want to go into the next one for Paris. What is it about that then? Is it the winning that's addictive? Uh, maybe, the f well, also like the feeling, of course, crossing the finish line is fantastic. Like, and also in the moment when you realize you have the win in your pocket and that can be maybe 500 meters or K away from the finish line when you sort of know that. You have snapped the gap and you have the win basically secured. Uh, but it, that feeling can be fantastic, but also the fantastic feeling of feeling efficient, like in training where you just feel so strong, like almost like a machine in training and everything feels easy and fast in the same time. So both of those, like uh, both the training aspect of it and also the racing aspect. I mean, it's fascinating to, I guess, I guess it's a champion's mindset, really, but to, to be able to win so much, but to still retain the hunger to win more. Like, do you do you ever wake up and think, ah, whatever? Or are you, are you always like, no, 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 there's, there's one more big goal, the next big goal, the next one? Uh, for me, it's always been like the next one. Like, uh, uh, to win races itself, uh, of course, give me joy, but I feel racing poor races is giving me way more sort of pain or like discomfort and the joy of winning the race itself. So uh, uh, it's always like when I win a race, it's sort of, okay, on to the next one. And if I do a poor race, it's staying on my mind for like weeks afterwards. So uh, I think it's, uh, of course, I, I love winning, but I guess losing is even worse. Do you feel like you need those losses then to fuel the that fire to win? That, that's what I'm trying to tell myself in the back end <laughs> of a poor race, like like trying to think, okay, at least it's good that it's it's hurting because it means it means something for me. And uh, uh, if you just go away from a poor race and feeling okay with it, then uh, it's, it's an even longer way to get back to the top. So um, I think it's, it's a good sign that it still uh, hurts to lose. I'm really keen to understand like where um, this motivation that, that you have in general, this drive you have has come from. Can you talk a little bit about um, your your childhood, your upbringing? I mean, the area you're from, I would I would imagine is much more, would be much more akin to people doing winter sports. No, no, no. I'm from Bergen. So it uh, rains two thirds of the year. So it's Probably not, not a lot of snow. Then. It's not a lot of <laughs> snow. So, um, uh, but it's like, good condition for endurance sport like um, it's of course it's a little bit like in the uk it's wet it's sort of not too warm but it's great for endurance sport and we have a lot of mountains around and uh, i feel 
uh, quite early, I sort of started loving just doing sports. And it didn't have to be like swimming, even though I did swimming and football, it wasn't just swimming and football I, I enjoyed. Like I loved every sort of sport. Like I, I bought myself a, a road bike, not because of I wanted to put swim, run and bike together, but simply because I just wanted to start riding and because it looked so cool on Tour de France and the TV. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, and uh, I, th I guess that's why I ended up in triathlon in the end of it, because that's the place where you can do the most activities uh, throughout the week. Were you from a sporty family? Did your parents your Not too sporty. Uh, like we did do a lot of like hikes and like going to the mountains in the weekend, but not like elite sport background in the family. But were, the, were your parents really encouraging for you to be outside, to be active, to be kind of doing stuff? Yeah, like of course, like you need supporting uh, parents to to help you to get to practice and sort of yeah be, being supportive uh, but I guess the inside drive and sort of the energy and sort of the need of being in like, like doing sports has come like just it's just like naturally for me like I've always had a lot of energy and sort of needed one way or another to get the energy out and uh, for me that's been sport has sort of got me there. Was that a journey is when you were younger to kind of try and find the right outlet? Because a kid with tons of energy can sometimes, you know, direct it in all kinds of Being weird ways. Kids, yeah, yeah. I think, um, yeah, like uh, I needed a way to get out the energy, and I think uh, first swimming and then like football and like just being active and has been a great way to get the energy out. And uh, yeah, it's been a good. Sort of medicine to yeah being able to get it out on the field and sort of relax outside interesting with that you played obviously a lot of football because i think one of the things that you have become your name is synonymous with is the guy who's very much kind of able to train on his own able to just be this machine you even used the word machine yourself earlier um but that football is obviously a team sport yeah. So it kind of that's that seems very different from this kind of sort of loner um, stereotype that sort of sits around you. This guy who can just lock himself in a room and sit his turbo for six hours. I guess that's what what I was maybe missing with football in the end, like because it's not like in in swimming you you do start training professionally from a very young age, and in football you sort of tend to wait until you are maybe twenty twenty five or. Uh, that like in in the late later years, so uh, I guess that's also why I naturally sort of switch more and more over to swimming and then triathlon because uh, there is just down to yourself and the work you're putting in is sort of the results you're getting out again. Did you used to find it annoying then when you played football that perhaps you would you would perhaps work at this high level and you'd see other teammates who just wouldn't be be no I, I think I quitted too soon like I I quitted when I was. 14 or 13 with football and that's sort of too early to uh, look evaluate the other teammates and sort of feeling it like that and also i was a goalkeeper so i think if oh, i wanted God. to have a career in that, that. in football i needed to be out in the field like using my engine so uh, i was sort of placed wrong in terms of my strength as well well goalkeeper is interesting because that's that's the loner position in football, isn't it? That's the one like everybody's that like that's out. the weird guy, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's yeah. the weird guy goes in goal. Like, they might be really good, but they're always like even in professional teams, everybody goes, "Oh, that's the weird, the weird guys going goal." <laughs> they're the ones who like being kicked in the face, who like the pain. Yeah, or yeah, I guess so. Yeah, <laughs> good way to put it. But I mean, that's I'm just thinking, does that that potentially translates kind of into the way that you've developed this kind of attitude of, of an ability to train so hard it's like kind of a similar mindset you don't mind being the person who's a bit different a bit out there a bit on their own it's not something that bothers you uh no i think uh, uh it's just been like the way i've been sort of getting out my social needs like to be out and enjoying training and sort of dreaming in the same way like when you go out for a ride or run you sort of start visualizing and sort of dreaming or into like other other places and not just mm. there by yourself but you're like in, in a race mode and uh, it's been my way to play around 
Yeah. I mean, can you talk a little bit about like how you're obviously putting these different elements together, as you said about when you got your road bike and things like that. How did triathlon come about as a thing? Like when you realized I could put all these together and, and then my goodness, I, actually, I might be quite good at this. I think it was never really a thing like as a kid, because uh, when I was young, it was like, Again, like as, as like being a goalkeeper, it was like for the weirdos. Like it wasn't really for kids. Like uh, <laughs> uh, when I started running uh, on the track, I did like Monday sessions with the older people in the club. And of course they were very welcoming. But then I was maybe 13, 12 years old, 14 years old. And we did like 10 by 1K on the track. And they were like, yeah, like typical triathletes in the 40s. <laughs> 50s and uh, and you had me like at 14 years old and uh, doing the sessions together and um, that was a little bit like the triathlon environment back in 2000 and early 2000 in Norway and then you also had a few other kids like Gustav was also doing his sort of stuff but he came more from a cycling background so he was training more on the other opposite side of the town and then we had a few kids in Oslo so it wasn't really a sport for where you came into triathlon for being social with kids at your age so how how did you kind of you're you're in this slightly different environment then you're with a, a lot of probably people who as you said are a bit older how did you kind of make obviously you were very talented that's obvious but how did you kind of make that transition then like what what was it or who did you meet or who found you at the right time to kind of move through and actually go okay you need to stop training just with these guys. Like there's there's a development path for you somewhere. Yeah, I guess it was sort of two important stages. First was uh, as a swimmer, uh, I feel I've always been the guy to jump in the pool first and sort of and also finish the session last. And so I've always been trying to do the little extra, but I was still the weakest swimmer in the squad uh, and always like just struggling to make the qualification to get into the like the nationals or to be in a, in a group. Uh, but I think the, the coaches saw that I had that sort of extra motivation and training to do to do what was needed. And they also saw that when we did like run sessions as part of the swim group, that I was uh, by far like the best uh, runner in a group. And uh, so one day uh, the swim coach in the group sort of uh, advised me to try something outside of the swimming pool, like either 5K or 10K open water because of my engine or like a triathlon or like something outside of just being in a traditional 100 or like 1500 meter in the pool. So he gave me like a list of different races and a local race in Oos, just outside of Bergen was one of them. And I signed up in 2008 and uh, yeah, didn't really know what to have on. So I had like a short uh, or like a tight down to the knees as I swam, no wetsuit because I didn't have a wetsuit. And uh, my father was reading on the internet that it was better to have like running shoes on the bike with like the the, the, the pedals you have sort of have in the spinning, uh, on the spinning bikes. So I was riding with that uh, on the bike, got caught uh, probably around 10 or 15k in on the bike by another guy but I caught him again on the run so uh, I think it was like a yeah around 30 guys starting that race and I came across the finish line first and a uh, few months later I was uh, doing the youth national swimming championship in like November in Bergen and there I got contacted by a stranger I didn't didn't know who he was and that ended up being Stein Gunnarsson, the father of Jürgen, who was one year younger than me. So he was also like in sort of my uh, uh, sort of my place. Like he he was swimming almost full time, but he wanted to be doing triathlon. And he was uh, starting this youth national team the following year. And he's been googling all over the internet, and uh, he heard that it was one guy from Bergen who had like potential as well. So. Then I was one of four guys to be a part of the youth national team from 2009. And he took me around for racing draft legal because back then we didn't have any draft legal races in Norway. So yeah, he took me to some youth European Cups and that, that was like when the 
journey started and got my eyes up for like what ITU triathlon and Olympic was and start sort of understanding that it's actually a sport. <laughs> It's so funny to step back as well when you say about the first race because it's like that's why most people come to triathlon like they don't know anything about it and your dad's googling like kind of almost what should you wear what should you be doing yeah yeah and uh because uh, like i tried to google or youtube like some videos and see like what triathlon was and and that was like the video of the beijing olympics when jan won the race but it was just like a two or three minutes highlight video so you don't really see much of the race itself and uh, also the transition is so all a new thing so uh, you're trying to sort of pick up the tips you're finding on on youtube and <laughs> internet so when you going back to that first race then when you kind of when you were doing it did you you were talking about already there like about how you were competing with another guy or whatever did you feel that real competitive fire burning in you just in that even in that first one and did that really light something inside you yeah i've always been competitive both like in training and also like when we did run sessions either at school like when you're doing like a test or like but I remember going out of the water and start riding the bike and I felt like pretty cool like to be racing not just like I think I think I still had the mindset that like as a swimmer you try to go as fast as you can throughout the race but it's still like cool to race in a different environment than just in a pool like we have the lane back and forth for yourself with like a more yeah, a man versus man. And then this this kind of, um, I guess, surge of, you're sort of touching upon it to start with there, but this surge of like growth within Norway and this development path that's kind of, that's gone through. Like how, how did, you know, how did you find yourself kind of coming into that environment? There's obviously other athletes. You mentioned Gustav already. It's a very notable one. Um, and, and then suddenly this, because it was almost like a, that's almost a developing uh, as you're as you're going along with it, it's not like a structure that's been there for like 20 years already. No, no, it's, it started, uh, but at the back end of 2008. So then first we were four guys, and then we got in one girl in 2009, and then in 2010 we had like a more uh, trying to recruit more athletes at around our age. So we had another camp in Oslo, and that's when Gustav and also his brother came in, Mikal. Uh, and uh, Lotte as well and um, the following year I think Casper came in so um, um, so, so it's been I, th I think the good thing by being sort of such a young team is that we don't have anyone to sort of try to copy and paste mm. because uh, we were sort of setting the base or like the standard ourselves in the training and also we had our own ideas of how we wanted to achieve our goals and when we started with the team in 2000 yeah like around 2010 2011 like the we didn't have to perform just to be in Rio and, and to win a medal in Rio but we had like support all the way going into Tokyo and like a long-term uh, dream and we were sort of working towards that and not just trying to get some uh, results in the short term how how important was that for you to have support going into well just to have a like long a, a long term vision because like you're uh, like a your day to day training animal but to be able to I think it's it important to have a long term dream like uh, even though like in 2012 I said like uh, to local newspaper that my goal was to win the Olympic Games in eight years and uh, the plan was to go to Rio and get experience and then. Yeah, the next one I would win. Uh, but then I think it's uh, important to have those dream. So you sort of know where you want to go, but you also need like to have a sort of uh, stairs in terms of ambitions. And uh, so as a junior, you always try to, you want you want to, to compare yourself to the best juniors in the world. And uh, I guess we had a very competitive junior generation with like Dorian and uh, Jake as well. and. Uh, and I felt like in, I think it was actually in Ponte Vedra in 2011, when I came from being 52nd in the junior European championship the year before to finish suddenly top nine in that race, I felt like, okay, I'm on track to become one of the best juniors in the world. And then I'm also on track to become one of the best seniors in the world. Did you ever have a moment of doubt? 
Like you sound incredibly confident from a young age, but did you ever like were there like it was a, a period of time where you were just like, oh, it's just not quite the development's not happening as I kind of want uh, it to. Uh, I had a f- stress fracture in 2013 by the end of the season, so that was my last year as a junior, and so we again we tried to think long term and uh, the whole season I tried to increase my bike volume. Uh, in order to be ready for the senior years and the Olympic distance. And I also tried to run more because I wanted to win the Junior World Championship in London. So I thought I had to do more volume on the run and change a bit on the tech, uh, technique on the run. And so by the end of the season, I ended up with a fracture and it took me nine months to come back and start running again. And of course, uh, when you're sort of going that long, Without getting uh, healthy, you sort of start, yeah, asking yourself if if we'll ever be healing again. But uh, other than that, I wouldn't say I've had too many doubts. Yeah, but you come across as very self-confident, and I guess that's part of part of what makes a champion as well. Do you ever do you ever think like kind of? Do you ever feel that, like, you must stand on that start line sometimes? Do you you kind of have that confidence? Do you look around at the other guys sometimes think, yeah, I'll beat you all? Yeah, or it depends. You can't trick yourself too much. Like, sometimes I know that uh, I'm not in the fitness I want to. I don't feel confident in the course. And uh, I haven't been running fast on the track sessions lately. Then it's hard to stand on the start line and... And sort of knowing that okay, I'm going to beat everyone here. Like, mm. uh, but of course, if the training has been good, like like in Tokyo, I felt I was in the best swim, bike, and run shape. Uh, I was better uh, confident in on the bike in the course than I was the year before or in 2019. I was running super well on the on the training, and I was also dealing very well with the heat. So then I was sort of feeling that okay, I. As long as I don't crash like I did two years before, I'm gonna win it. Uh, but then, other times when you feel you haven't done the preparation or you don't feel confident in the course, it's difficult to trick yourself. But then, I try to take the experience I can out of the races, and uh, yeah, like like uh, often you, when you're standing there on the start line. It's easy to be afraid of failing if you feel you haven't done the preparation. But then I think it's better to just look at the, what's important to execute and sort of look at those things and take it as a practice for the next race. It's interesting, though, because you said, uh, like the way you've spoken about it, like I would imagine winning for, for the majority of elite athletes racing, short course racing, um, winning the Olympic gold medal is, is a, a completely life changing moment. That's like everything. I, I, I mean, I'm, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I'm getting the impression for you maybe it was less life-changing than for other people because it was just, it, it, the way you present it, and I, I struggle to believe this is true completely, but it's almost like, right, I've ticked that box. What's what's the next step yeah. on this journey? Yeah, so I, I feel like <laughs> it sounds strange, but like it, for me it's been like the same way as winning a European Cup as a junior, like it's it's a part of like it's 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 like a race you want to win and you tick it off like and you go to the next one, and the joy of yes yeah, like sprinting away from Gordon Benson and Mark Austin in a Junior Cup in 2012, like the joy there and like the feeling and the, the adrenaline adrenaline rush you're getting from that could be like the same feeling or even better than winning uh, a world title these days, like. Uh, so it, it depends on how unsecure you have been in the race and if you've been able to sort of, sort of overperform compared to what you were expecting going into the race. But the biggest difference now, I would say, is uh, that it's more people around that cares. Like before, it's, mm. I sort of just raced for myself, but now if I win, it means more for like sponsors. And it's, yeah. That's interesting because it's like a, it's like a pressure shift in a way because you you suddenly go from this is all about me and like if if things go badly the person i'm letting down is me and to suddenly like you look at all these people who are so invested in your success um do you feel do you feel pressure sometimes does that ever weigh on you at all i think the pressure of putting on myself is mainly for myself so even though i have more people around who sort of be winning if i'm winning i still race for myself and be- 
and I turn up to a race because I want to win. And I think it's important that you really want it from deep, deep inside yourself. It, it's hard to get that external motivation because you want me to win or like I think you really need to have that inside drive. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting because I guess that's what has to motivate everything. Like, I don't know how somebody could train as hard as you train without having that. There's no, you couldn't replace that from being a part of you. No. That motivation. What What is it that, how, I mean, the, the amount that you train, the volume of your training is one of the things that kind of is a hallmark of, of who you are in the triathlon world. Um, how have you come about finding the right volume that's not, that, that works I've, for you as a person? Yeah, I've, uh, well, first, I think it's important to love what you're doing. Like 90% of the time you have to enjoy going out and uh, doing the sessions. So actually, if you just strip it down and you do only uh, training, sleeping and eating, then it's quite easy to train a lot and hard. Like then it comes very naturally. So it's the more stress you're putting on the, the life around, the more hard it is to do this to do the training uh but i think uh yeah simply i guess a little bit because we didn't have any sort of uh ways to copy and paste when i was younger like uh, when i first started with triathlon we had no one to sort of just do like the older athletes were doing so uh, i've always been training very very high volume from even from a swimmer age since I was doing swimming and uh, I think first year when I started like moving towards proper triathlon training I got overtrained in transition from 2011 to 2012 and then I sort of realized that okay if I want to become best I have to be more take more responsibility for my own training and slow down when I need to slow down and train more when I feel I can train more so uh, I've for yeah, well over a decade, be sort of aware that I'm the one who also will always have to yeah cut the session short if I feel for it. Yeah, I mean, in terms of the balance you you said there, like if you if you strip it back to basically just training, sleeping, and eating, then it's easy. But how do you how do you I guess weigh as a value what other things have like nor you know normal people. You must see like oh they have they spend time with their partner or they um, go out for a nice meal or they you know they go on holiday and they take a week off and things like that. Like how do you how can you how do you measure the kind of value or is there any trade off? Like you go okay I'll do a bit of this but not that. I don't feel like sacrificing too much. Like it's I would rather look at the, the ups that I'm getting. Like I can travel to Malibu and do Super League racing. Like it's not too many at my age. You can sort of have one week in, uh, what was like early this week, like in Silverstone and then before that being in, in Ponte Vedra and then coming here to Malibu and then back again to Europe next week. So it's, uh, I would say it's a pretty cool lifestyle to have and try to more look at the the pros I'm getting by being a athlete. So I'm quite interested to put to you a couple of points because we did one of these face-to-face -face in interviews with Gustav, as you know. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your relationship, but just while we're on this topic, he described it as semi-sustainable, I believe, like he, the, this kind of lifestyle and that he was he felt like he could invest in it at the moment, but kind of he was quite open that I'm not sure how long like a human can sustain shutting down almost like what everybody else does at the expense of this. Is that is that how you feel? Or do you feel completely different to that? Uh, I, I see his point with uh, semi-sustainable, but uh, I think in terms of making it more sustainable, you have to close down more. <laughs> 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 like, uh, as I said, like in order to win races, you have to train hard. You try have to train a lot. And the easiest way to do that is to close down. <laughs> Do you ever, I mean, I mean, I'm guessing the, it almost feels like a fruitless question because if you're, if you're close to that point, it's yeah. very hard to have the perspective, but do you, do you ever have a moment where you like reflect and ask? Cause that's what Gustav was basically saying. He's like, yeah, there are moments when I go kind of, I ask myself, is it actually worth it? He concludes, yes, it is worth it at the yeah. moment, but like he had, he admitted he has these moments where he does say, uh, I'm not, I'm not sure. Do you ever have that doubt? 
I guess I've asked myself the question, but uh, I wouldn't say I have the doubts. Like, uh, uh, I feel I can quit the sport whenever I want. And I do the sport because I enjoy not just the races, but like the swim, bike and run on a daily basis. So uh, I don't feel as sacrificing in the same way. Yeah, well, I mean that's completely fair enough. Yeah. It's just how you feel. But um, this so this Norwegian like real like high performance team you've built kind of around you now as well. Um, the dynamic there is really interesting with your coach and with uh, with Gustav as well. Obviously, you and Gustav have, have become very close. You've both been incredibly successful, uh, and you've kind of gone on these journeys together um, to and, and achieve this success. Uh, how how do you see Gustav, like your relationship with him, how that's developed and, and how you view him? I feel it's very much the same as uh, like 10 years ago when we start training, uh, like uh, I guess the first we like start going for training camps together and then we try to do as much intensity workouts together at home in Bergen. So like when we did a track session or a brick session, we sort of met in the middle and uh, did the session there together. And uh, uh, I guess that's also why it's easier to uh, still be training together and sort of sharing the ups and downs because it was something we dreamed about together like 10 years ago. And now we are sort of having won most of the races we want to win. And... uh, uh also we yeah I, I know that by having him around it makes my life and my journey easier as well and it makes the training better and i'm having the chance to learn from one of the best triathletes in the world and hopefully he feels like the same that uh, by training together we can sort of lift each other up and also making the not just the training but like the the journey more fun as well Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. He described his role as, I think, being a semi-punchable guy for you in training. Uh, Is that how you see him? I'm the semi-puncher guy. (laughs) (laughs) No, I wouldn't wouldn't say, like, of of course, uh, we need to have some times where it's like race mode. It's like we have to, uh, yeah, like you have to take off the gloves sometimes. But 99% of the time we are trying to help each other, like, if he's having a rough time uh, doing a threshold sessions up on the bike up in Sierra Nevada, it's not like I'm increasing the pace just to drop him. And I might just, as long as I'm staying in my intensity zone, I'm letting him getting a sort of a free ride, even though it's very hard to get a free ride in uphill up to Sierra Nevada, mm-hmm. uh, just because then I know that he will get a good session and I'm getting a good session. And then the next time I'm having a tougher day, then he can sort of help me getting through my session as well. So I think we're more often trying to help each other than trying to to smash each other. And how about as like, um, as how do you see him as like a person and, and a friend as well? Like not just a training colleague um, and, and racer. I would say he's the more social guy, at least in the beginning. So he's the one who's uh, keeping on track on the social level and what other people is doing. Well, I might be more the <laughs> robotic guy in terms of the socializing stuff. Uh, but still, like, we're both very professional in terms of the training is important. And uh, that's what we want to do. And we both are invested full, fully to do everything we can. So yeah. if that's, like, how you, you kind of see yourself a little bit, you see yourself as, like, the robotic guy a little bit, and that's how you, how you feel... How hard has it been to, to to deal with some of the elements that come with success? Like there's a lot of attention on you. Uh, there's a lot of focus on what you do. There's loads of people who want to talk about what you do and, and you know, say it's great or say it's awful or, or, you know, criticize you. You have to do things like this. You have to do sponsor commitments. You have to be in front of cameras. I think if, if like I imagine that's not come naturally in that case. I, th- I think uh, actually as, as a kid when I was dreaming about becoming like, the number one triathlete and like looking up to Javi and Ellie and like those guys as a junior, then I think I wanted to go uh, to have that bib number one on my, like the tattoo on my arms. And I wanted to be that guy that everyone is uh, looking at and remember uh, running out with uh, Mario Mola in Yokohama in 2016. And everyone was just screaming, Mario, Mario, Mario. Mm-hmm. I guess nobody knew my name, you know? Like, I wanted to be in that position where 
you're going into a race as the man to beat and sort of that people are sort of watching over their shoulder and okay he's he's uh he's he, he's probably going to be strong and uh yeah because i wanted to be in a position i feel it comes more naturally because i want to be there yeah so so you kind of think it's, you, a, it's a part of the sport you're prepared to pay the price for success effectively yeah if that's what comes with it so um in terms of this Norwegian method that's become like, you know, it's, it's a, a phrase that's coined now, Norwegian method. Obviously, that's like doesn't really do it justice. But like, can you talk to us a little bit about kind of like you're obviously doing some things that are very different, that are very cutting edge, um, you know, and developing new technologies as well with with your company as well. Like, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how how things have developed in the sport and how you see them developing in the future? Yeah, so. I think like in general in Norway we've been trading a lot of high volume in endurance sport and been very focused on threshold training uh, even though that a lot of uh, teams and athletes hasn't really done too much like testing they just call it threshold training but then when you bring in more and more testing and lactate testing and uh, getting an understanding of what is the real threshold and being more aware of intensity tr control I think that has been the key to our success in terms of being able to sustain that uh, volume for such a long time. Uh, and also a part of the success for, or key to our success. Uh, and of course, we want always want to take it one step further. And the same we've done now with uh, this entire tech company and trying to work with partners in, in order to uh, both uh help us uh working with them closer uh, closely and uh getting like uh sensors and uh to to get the sensors that we can use in order to uh, do the testing we want to do as an example like going into tokyo we all knew that it would be a very very warm and humid race and we needed a way to get a better, better understanding of our core temperature and uh, I guess when we started like focusing on uh, Tokyo, it wasn't really any good ways of measuring core temperature other than taking the, the temperature pill or putting it up from the back end. And uh, then we came across with core body sensor was like putting the sensor here and then uh, working with them in order to find like a protocol for a heat uh, prep going into Tokyo and also for other warmer races and uh, working with partners like that has definitely been helping us to get more knowledge that other athletes hasn't been able to get. So like, I'm really curious as to like how, how it makes you feel because you work incredibly hard, you train incredibly hard. I mean, you might put yourself as the hardest trainer in the sport or right up there. You're invested in all this technology and whatever. And, and yet, I guess, I, maybe it's because we live in the world of endurance sports and everything that's happened in endurance sports, but still there will be people, there are people who say, ah, it must be on something to be this good. Like it's, does, how does that make you feel when you hear people just sort of flippantly throw that your way? Well, I guess it's, uh, I've heard it quite early, but especially by being like heavier build. And, uh, so I've heard it for, yeah, since I sort of started racing in the well in the senior elite and also especially when we took the one to three in Bermuda. And since then, I would say it's sort of been fading off a little bit, like the uh, the comments. I think it was more comments before. Uh, but again, I want to, as a kid, you always want to be overperforming. Like you, that's like the races you're dreaming for doing and like having that surprising race so uh yeah like my dream is to overperform almost and uh if people are suspicious about that then um they can be it's like you can't really prove them sort of wrong because there's no real testing that can sort of prove your yeah do you feel like do you feel 
a little bit sick that you have to sit here and like answer a question like that or to be able to say like I'm clean I've always been clean does that like annoy you that you have to do that not really uh, because it's it's not too much talk about it I would say in triathlon of course you had like a little uh, wave when Colin mm. that's what I was thinking yeah. about that's why it was on my mind yeah so it's, it hasn't been too much doping talk in triathlon and even when you had like in Tokyo you had a couple of athletes being caught uh, both in Tokyo and also afterwards it wasn't much talk around that even so um, yeah I guess it's uh, good for the sport to have uh, more awareness around it and uh, it's a uh, it's a fight we still have to or keep fighting yeah absolutely and in terms of um, in terms of like how you've built this like long-term plan around yourself and you've managed to evolve it as, as time has gone on and the timelines obviously stretch a little bit further uh, on how how have you actually found from a theory to an execution of kind of being short long short long you know and the, and the way that you mix this up how how actually challenging has it been in reality and particularly to try and get I guess now to get to not just being competitive at short distance, but going, well, the only reason to turn up to Paris, I've already got a gold medal. The only reason yeah. to turn up to Paris is to try and win another one. So I've not just got to be competitive. I've got to be the very, very best. But coming down from obviously racing long distance. I think coming from short to long is something we've always been confident about. And I guess that's has to do with both the volume we have done as a kid. And we felt like we were already training like the same volume as they do in long distance. And and uh, uh, even we did like a couple of 70 point trees because I won in this in 2019. I did some 70 point trees in 17 as well, and he did his first win in 2016 in Haugesund. So we've always been like confident that, of course, we can do like half and even full distance Ironman before having done any of them. Uh, and I feel we were sort of right. <laughs> But and and now the journey back to short distance is, uh, of course, it's challenging. But I feel I'm within reach in terms of uh, getting where I want to be for Paris next year. Um, I, I guess I've been showing that I'm like a minute too slow on the run this year uh, in order to fight with Alex and Hayden, especially. But I also feel I'm probably well over a minute away from my finest run shape as well so as long as uh, those sort of is connected and i feel um i know what i have to do over the next 10 months in order to be competitive so where does a long term plan go after paris then P presumably i'm guessing that you go long again yep uh, kona kona 24 <laughs> kona of course but w um kona 24 Okay. So it's like three months in between there. And the nice thing now is that I know the know the course. Like it's Queen K out, up to Havi, back again. And the same with the run, like you go a little bit into Alihi Drive and then over to towards NG Lab and back again. So know the course, know the conditions. How, how are you going to manage that in terms of like a from a pure like volume sense of because you, you, I assume you've almost got to be Kona ready when you go to Paris. No, I wouldn't. I'm not going to do any sacrificing there in order to. Uh, it's like the same with, with Tokyo. Like, I, even though I signed up for an Ironman to qualify before I raced Tokyo, I didn't train anything specifically for Ironman before Tokyo because I think if you want to win the, an Olympic gold medal, you have to be all in with your training uh, for it. Uh, so I will train all in for Paris and have nothing in mind in terms of uh, uh kona and then when you when i cross the finish line it's switching <laughs> switching bike probably the next day and then going on to the long distance bike or kdx do you uh i mean yeah i mean give yourself like a day to enjoy it why not um do you see yourself uh going short again can you can you fathom doing this again for la or is 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 short over after paris do you think it's it's hard to say. It depends on how Paris goes. If I win Paris, 
<laughs> Why not? <laughs> like I say, if you win Paris, it's almost like that's the time to stop, is it? No, 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 no If you win no, Paris, that's the time to carry on. I don't know how that works. No, I think if I win Paris, it's a reason to give it another try in uh, in LA. If I do it bad in uh, Paris, I might have to do LA in order to do it well again. Exactly. So. <laughs> exactly. Um, well, that's really, really interesting that you would consider, you would even consider trying to, to trying to do this again. Is there a bit of you, is there any part of you, well, you've said about wanting, dreaming of being number one when you were, you, you were younger, having the number one, people looking at you, you winning the big races. Is there a bit of you, therefore, that thinks at all about your legacy, this winning legacy that you've got, the, the titles that you're accumulating at the moment and potentially kind of, being right there in, you know, or maybe unarguably being the greatest ever? Well, f of course I want to have a resume that's uh, hard to copy. And uh, I guess already, or I think it's going to be very hard to copy what I did in Tokyo and then an arm and world title within the same year uh, in the future. And if I can do it again, uh, it will be amazing. But again, I also race the races because I want to win more races myself. That's great. Yeah. Christian, thank you so much for taking the time and uh, letting us get to know you a little bit better. And we'd certainly wish you all the very best for Paris, for Kona and for whatever else lays ahead for you. Thank you very much. Thank you.